all our AEI-EI um, uh, event, where currently registered is 302 participants from 17 countries. And these 70 countries comes from uh, just a short uh, prelude on that. Australia, Bahrain, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Kuwait, Malaysia, Myanmar, Oman, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Thailand, United Arab Emirates, as well as Vietnam. So uh, once again, thank you uh, for all uh, to join us. And without further ado, I will hand over the control to the uh, host of the day, Pak Angoro Yudo, to uh, moderate the session. Over to you, Pak Angoro. Thank you very much, Insulio, for the time. Uh, let me take off from now. Uh, before we start the lecture by Professor Saipur, uh, let me to let me introduce a, a ASEAN uh, Engineering Inspector. Uh, let me open my presentation first. Okay, so uh, let me uh, introduce the, our organization to all the audience uh, because in my experience, uh, electrical uh, ASEAN engineering inspector electrical installation is still not a very well known uh, organization, so many people are are uh, unaware of our, our organization, so let me give a brief introduction. So we will talk about the organization, then we will talk about this, what we do, the objective, and uh, who is the steering committee and our activities and everything. So uh, ASEAN Engineering Inspector, uh, Electrical and Installation Working Group is actually part of ASEAN Engineering Register. So and. ASEAN Engineering Register itself is part of uh, ASEAN Federation of Engineering Organizations. So in ASEAN, we have uh, 10 uh, different uh, engineering organizations, uh, one in each country. Then we, we collaborate with all these 10 organizations and uh, this, is, this is part of our activities. So the Electrical Installation Working Group is uh, officially established in November 2017 during our 35th conference uh, in Bangkok, Thailand. So uh, since our inception, uh, we have already produced a white paper on electrical installation standard and regulation. Uh, this white paper gives a very quite detail. I mean, it's not very detailed, but it's not also not, a, not a narrow. So it's in between. It gives us a lot of information about electrical uh, installation in all ASEAN countries. So, uh, then, and as we know that uh, electrical installation plays an important role for 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 us. So this this is why we uh, uh, focus on this issue. So there are a few objectives the, of this uh, organization. Some are short term and some are long term object, objective. And as you see in the our presentation. Uh, in the short term, we want to uh, we work on the installation standard and regulation. So this, what we want, we want we 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 want to work together between our, our countries uh, in in this area. So in the long term, we want to provide the training and certification for electrical engineers. Uh, why? Because uh, one of our tagline is asianizing electrical engineers. So we want our electrical engineer in Asian countries uh, can be uh, can be accepted in our Asian countries, can work in our Asian countries. So we are not uh, limited by uh, our boundary, but we can work in our Asian countries to work together and make a science, make a, con a greater contribution than just working alone. So this is the steering committee. Uh, the chairman is uh, Insignor Yao, who opened this uh, webinar uh, this evening. So then the secretary is uh, uh, Insignor P.J. Lau, and then we have uh, officer from 
all the ten countries uh, we have from Brunei, uh, Engineer Simon, then from Cambodia, uh, His Excellency Lee, uh, from Indonesia, uh, Doctor Engineer Peke, from Laos, uh, Engineer sorry, uh, oh, sorry I cannot <laughs> also. You know, we have uh, all the represent representative from all the Asian countries. Uh, then, so our activities we have a lot of activities at the moment. For example, uh, this uh, webinar is one of the regular activities that we carried out. Uh, we have several series. The distinguished lecture series, the standard series. We have also some business talk series, and we have a lot of things that uh, we want to facilitate all the electrical engineers in ASEAN. So, uh, also in creating awareness in our electrical engineers in ASEAN, we have conducted several roadshows. Uh, unfortunately, since the beginning of 2020, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we cannot do the roadshow. Uh, we hope that after the pandemic uh, uh, can be controlled and managed uh, in our countries, then we can uh, start again these activities, uh, roadshow, roadshow activities, uh, so that uh, more people, more electrical engineers will uh, be more aware about this organization and not only the organization, but also our uh, objective. So we have several technical subcommittee. Uh, there are ten, at the moment, there are 10 subcommittee, and this each subcommittee will work on specific uh, topic. Uh, so this is some success stories. This is the roadshow, the conference, the, the discussion that we have. Uh, carried up in our countries in ASEAN. Uh, I hope that you, you all can join us in the future. Okay, so this is the power of electrical engineering. And as I said uh, before, we want to actionize uh, electrical engineers. So please join us. So, uh, before we start the lecture from Professor Saifur, let me let me introduce uh, Professor Saifur Rahman. Professor Saifur Rahman is a director of Virginia Tech Advanced Research Institute in the USA. Uh, he was the president of IEEE Power and Energy Society from 2018 to 2019. And uh, Professor Saifur Rahman is the Joseph Loring Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, he is also the director of Center for Energy and Global Environment. Uh, he is a life fellow of the IEEE and uh, IEEE Millennium Medal winner. Um, uh, he, he was the founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Electrification Magazine and the IEEE Transaction on, of Sustainable Energy. Uh, Professor Saifur Rahman has published over 1,050 journal paper and has made over 600 conference and invited presentation. He is a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Power and Energy Society and has lectured on renewable energy, energy efficiency, smart grid, energy internet, blockchain, IoT sensor, and, every, and also some other topic. And he has done this lecture in over 30 countries. And I would like also to mention that at the moment, Professor Saifur Rahman is running for IEEE president. So any of you, the attend, attendee of the this evening uh, lecture, who, who is a IEEE member? Who, who is a IEEE member? Please support Professor Saifur Rahman. Uh, the election will be carried out in I think in August, August 2021. So please uh, join us to support Professor Saifur Rahman. And maybe if you are not 
an IEEE member, maybe you can consider of uh, becoming an IEEE member and also then support Professor Said Rahman. Uh, without further ado, I think uh, I will present this stage to Professor Said Rahman to start uh, his insight uh, about uh, energy efficiency. Uh, thank you. Please, Professor Saiful. Thank you, Pangaro. Nice introduction. And also, Engineer Chao Fong. Appreciate it. So, you give me the presenter access. Okay. Good. Yes, you Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay, welcome to this lecture. Everybody, I see about 90 or so people already signed up online, plus uh, you got Facebook attendees. So I appreciate your attendance and your interest. So if you, as you see that, as you see my title, the three items I want to focus on. One is energy efficiency. Second is smart building. Third is IoT sensors. So how all of that work together, how we use IoT sensors in smart buildings to get energy efficiency. That's the objective that I'm, I'm pursuing today. So with that, let me, let me move on uh, to the next slide. Why we did this research at Virginia Tech some years ago, which resulted in this platform. In the US, Buildings consume over 40% of the total energy, not just electricity. That is coal, oil, gas, all that together, 40% goes to buildings. For two reasons, because buildings require significant heating and cooling in the US, number one. Number two, buildings have no lights in the US, and lights are never turned off. So if we can do some energy efficiency program, we can save a lot of energy. Primarily, we are focusing on small buildings, 500 square meters or less, or medium-sized buildings, 5,000 square meters or less, because those are the buildings which do not have any building automation products typically. So we built at Virginia Tech, and now there's a company doing this work, a product called WISE Building, W-I-A-C, B-L-D-G. In fact, if you go to uh, App Store, you can find a, an app with that name, WISE B-L-D-G. So that is, we'll discuss how we built it, how it works. That's the idea. Now, we have done to be useful to a small building, medium building, large building. We call it an open architecture platform for building energy efficiency, meaning you can add more function, functions as your needs change. That's why we call it open architecture. You'll see, we start with heating and cooling, we go to lighting, we go to rooftop solar, we go to many different things. So if you follow the yellow or orange box on the upper left-hand side, it is an energy management open architecture software solution that is engineered to improve sensing and control of all IoT enabled equipment in commercial buildings. Could be big house also. So any IoT device we can control and manage. Our initial focus was three, the red box in the middle on the right hand side, heating, ventilation, air conditioning called HVAC for short, lighting loads and plug loads. You can control them. I'll show you examples in a few minutes. The value is the blue box on the lower right-hand side. It improves energy efficiency and facilitates peak load savings in commercial buildings. It's done. If you want to know more, we cannot have a lot of time today in this seminar. There is a website on the upper right-hand side in the yellow box called bemcontrols.com. That website has more examples, test cases, video clips. So please, when you have time, visit that website, bemcontrols.com, and get to know more. Okay, let's move on now. So we are now looking at this setup, in, this is my lab setup in this case, where I have put many of these devices, like thermostat, lighting controller, 
occupancy sensor, many things, and show how it works. The building on the left is kind of looking like my building, not exactly my building, but that building also have rooftop solar. So that's the setup. I'm showing this set of equipment or sensors on one floor of my building. On the left-hand side, you see different kinds of thermostats, upper left-hand side. These are Wi-Fi, Zigbee thermostats. Then you have VAV controller for, for uh, heating and cooling, uh, rooftop units, uh, smart light bulb. We have uh, light switch, lighting load controller, step dim ballast, smart plug, different kinds of smart plugs, occupancy sensor, light sensor, power meters. All of that is in my lab. And I'll show you examples how we did that and how we deploy it as we go forward. Now, then we have, this is a challenge we had to face. We at a university, we do not manufacture any IoT device. We buy things from the open market. A vendor for, let's say, thermostat or a lighting controller or, an, uh, or a um, occupancy sensor, they choose their protocol for communication that they feel more comfortable and secure. We have no control over that. As a result, we get devices, IoT devices, which are Ethernet, serial interface, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, BACnet, Modbus, web interface, open ADR. We had to develop algorithm in my lab so that we can read any of those devices using their protocols without any problem. So we have done that, that we have built that translators. So now as a result, we can have any kind of device, any protocol that is available on the open market and work with them. That was our biggest challenge and biggest contribution. Okay, now that was one case. Now what you have done, that you see my lab, that's one, one lab, right, one floor but we have many buildings on our campus. We have now expanded this work to multiple buildings, which are now connected over the cloud through Amazon Web Service in our case. So now you can see we got many buildings. Each building has its own account in the cloud and where we host the software algorithm and the data sets for that building and they communicate via internet through the cloud. And you have a example here, a campus environment where we have many buildings. Each building, if you look on the right-hand side, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, HVAC, lighting loads, plug loads, sensor power meters, water meters, rooftop PV and storage, and security camera. All of those devices are now being monitored and controlled by this wise building platform, which is sitting in the cloud for that building. In addition to that, that network is a campus network in our case. There is a campus energy manager. He has control or visibility for every building in the system. Let's see the each sub subnet here. Also, we are connected to the cloud, to the electric power company, supplying electricity to our campus. If they have any control signals, peak load reduction, pricing change, we get that information transmitted in real time and take action based on that. What is important? Sometimes on very hot summer days, we have capacity, tight capacity, not shortage, capacity is tight. Rather than the power company starting a gas turbine, they would send signals to buildings to cut their load by two, three, four percent, small amount. If many people do that, they can save enough capacity. They do not have to turn on their gas generator. So that's why it is important for us to get the signal from the power company, all of that in the cloud. If you want to know more, again, this box on the, in the middle of the page at the bottom, bemcontrols.com, that has more data, more information. If you want to go there, please, Take your time when you have a chance to do that. Now, we are now saying, because we have built this platform called Wise Building, it is, the good thing is it can be add on. You don't have to put the building automation when you build the building. Normally what happens when you build the building, you put the SCADA network, network for uh, wiring all that, it's fine. 
But if building is old, has been built, was not designed for building automation to begin with, then we have a problem. So since we have put a wireless solution with a stick, thermostat, lighting controller, occupancy sensor on the wall, that's it. No need to do any wiring because it's all wireless. That is why we claim our wise building platform can make any old building smart. Look at this. Before I go to the building, give you some added value. Data that you have collected so far show that we get about 20% savings in energy by controlling and scheduling our air conditioner and, and heating and cooling units, and 25% on the average savings of lighting energy because of dimming of lights and scheduling lights when they are not being used, the, in the US market that is. In addition to that, we found two other benefits from our wise building platform de deployment. What is that? Number one is improve operations and maintenance. Why is it important? Many buildings that we work on have rooftops, rooftop air conditioners, typical or, or ground mounted air conditioners. They run fine, no problem. Sometimes they get dirty, they get some, uh, some um, thing catches the, the shaft and they run tight. If they get dirty, the bearing is dirty, uh, some, some dirt or cloth got in there, it's tight. What happens if his bearing is tight because of the high torque requirement, the motor will motor for the compressor will pull more current. You don't notice that because you're not on the roof watching this thing. So it goes on for some time, few days, and then the thing, the shaft is, is tight, it, the bearing breaks. Bearing breaks, then you know that the AC is not running. Then you call the engineer, they come in, yeah, bearing broke, we would order parts, it takes two days, parts come in, then come back and schedule the repair. It takes four or five days for the AC to be repaired. In those five days, you're hurting real bad. Temperature outside is 35, 38 humid. So this is how life is. We said because we are monitoring the power consumption or the motor in the compressor, in the air conditioner in real time, then we have some flag. If the power consumption current draw is higher than normal, the system, wise building, sends an SMS or a even a phone call recording saying that the machine number 16 on building two roof is running hot. It's not broken yet. So here he can come in to the roof, check it. Yes, that machine is running hot because bearing is tight. Stop the, stop the machine for a few minutes, clear the bearing, goes back, everything is fine. This is different than nobody watching it, bearing breaks and you lose air conditioning. That's one benefit. We say it allows the building operator to investigate the problem before the device fails. That's important. Second is occupant satisfaction. Since we're monitoring the air quality inside the building, we know the carbon dioxide concentration, PM 2.5 concentration, someday SARS virus concentration in the building, we can do that. Because we are monitoring these concentrations, we know what is the limit above which this will become unhealthy. So since we have the data, we can take some action. I'll give an example in a few minutes. So we have deployed our solution wise building in many buildings in Virginia and Washington DC, Maryland area. Some examples here in Alexandria. I see uh, Andiga in, in, the, in the audience. He was there in Alexandria many years ago. Arlington, Blacksburg, Maryland, all, all of those, that's fine. This is one building we have, we have, uh, we have uh, put the equipment, our, our sensors and controllers and managing this building. It's a small building. 25,000 square feet at 2,500 square meters. Uh, monthly energy consumption, 14 to 25 megawatt hours. It is high in summer because of air conditioning. And peak load, 61 kilowatt. That's the building. We put our solution there. One classroom in that building you just saw. That building is 74 years old now. It's old building. These are the devices we put in that building. On the upper right-hand side is an environmental sensor. It senses carbon dioxide, noise, temperature, relative humidity, one sensor, Wi-Fi. It is sending signal 
to the box on the right hand side called BMOS core. That box has a Raspberry Pi type device, collects information about the level of CO2 concentration, uh, decibel noise, degree temperature, and percentage humidity. That is collected and takes some action. I'll get back to that in a minute. Below that BMOS core box, we have a plug load controller. That is smart plug load controller. It can be remotely accessed, turning, in, turning them off and on as needed. Why is that important? This classroom has, like any other classroom, has a ceiling mounted LCD projector. It has a computer and a printer, all connected to the wall, plugged in, and they're always plugged in. Nobody turns these things off. They're used for the class, class is over, teacher leaves, students leave, and the thing stays on all night, all day, next day. Since you put a plug load controller, we'll connect all these LCD projector, printer, computer to the smart plug, which can be remotely controlled by somebody who manages the building. Suppose at 9.30, we know classes end, is designed to turn off at 9.35 p.m. and come back on next day afternoon like this. If you go across the page on the left-hand side, we have a motion sensor that is telling us if there is nobody in the classroom, dim the lights. Don't run the air conditioning so high. Keep it warmer than normal. That is done. Also, we have above that on the left-hand side, a thermostat is a wireless smart thermostat. That thermostat is remotely controllable. So if nobody in the classroom, we will raise the temperature from 23 to 26, 27 maybe degree Celsius. So we are not using as much electricity as we do otherwise. And of course, on the roof, we have this air conditioner, which is serving this floor of this classroom building. And we put a power meter there to see as we change the temperature setting, how much power consumption is dropping or when is the power consumption highest? All of that data in our uh, wise building platform. Good. Now, data or observation from that classroom. We have this uh, BMOS core, BMOS or wise building core has information on the, in this case, it's a, it's a, it's a iPad or desktop, Indoor temperature in Fahrenheit, by the way, 71.4, humidity, pressure, CO2 concentration, noise. The, all the data is on my user interface. I can see it on my smartphone or my laptop or, or my, so my uh, iPad. That's how we are showing this example. Also, we monitor the outdoor environment, temperature, humidity, outdoor. Those are important data we need for controlling air conditioners. What we found out by accident, that we didn't plan for this, his plan was heating and cooling. Since we monitor the CO2 level, see the blue box on the lower right-hand side? The CO2 level changes significantly as people come to the classroom. Classroom is here, no windows, by the way. The people breathe and the CO2 concentration goes up. Starts about 500, close to ambient, and people walk, in, walk by on the floor, people come in. Slowly by 7 o'clock, 6.30 or so, when the class starts, air conditioning is running and the CO2 level continues to go up. Goes up slowly and slowly by 9 o'clock or so, it has reached a limit of 1,100 parts per million, 1,100. Ambient is about 400, 456, something like this. So we have two and a half times. That is uncomfortable that is unhealthy, but you don't know that. We don't monitor CO2 in classrooms anywhere. What do you do? So we said, and what is the impact of working in a closed environment without fresh ventilation? CO2 level goes up and you feel headache, nausea, uncomfortable, lack of energy, lack of energy and uncomfortable. So you go home, tell your family, a long day at work, I don't feel good, I'm feeling a headache because bad day at work. It's not a bad day. It's just room that you work in has too much CO2. How you solve this problem? As soon as the CO2 concentration goes above 700 parts per million in this classroom, we got a sensor, I showed you, right? 
the sensor on the upper right hand side, it gives me real time data for the CO2 concentration. As soon as that concentration goes over 700 parts per million, we throw more fresh air from the ceiling in this classroom. As you throw more fresh air, you dilute the CO2 concentration and the level goes down. That's something nobody does. Our system can do it because we monitor the CO2 level. So this is how it is set up for CO2 concentration. This is done. Now let me go back to the same data set for the heating cooling application. This is data showing how much energy and how much power peak load we can reduce by applying this wise building platform, okay? On the left-hand side, third of the page, I am showing you what we have put in that building. We put six thermostats, six power meters, for each zone has its own power meter, one lithium ion battery to see the battery can be used to reduce the peak load during the hot afternoon days in summer. And one environmental sensor that gives you CO2 and noise and humidity concentration numbers. Our data shows by using the wise building platform, we could save 27% of energy in that building. In fact, if you do this in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, it's even more because your AC runs much more than in Virginia. So this is an interesting data set. So what we did, we have some reference numbers. We said the compressor consumption for that floor air conditioner for three months in summer, July, June, July, August was 8,340 kilowatt hour, measured data from the meter without our system in place. Then we look for one year, two years later, when we have similar outdoor conditions and then see under similar outdoor, outdoor conditions, how much energy can be saved by deploying the building control system. We saw that num number came down uh, two years later to 6,071 kilowatt hour. That gives us about 28, 26.8% savings. That's the number savings, measured data. Now, if you focus your attention to the middle part of the page, the section bounded by the gray box, the upper gray box reads temperature profile before wise building demand reduction, before our system. What was the system looking like at the time? The gray box at the bottom, set point 20, sorry, 74 degree Fahrenheit, about 22, 22 and a half, 22.5 Celsius. We are monitoring energy usage from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. That's where the peak load happens for that air conditioner. We saw the energy usage was 2.72 kilowatt hour for that one air conditioner for four hours. And maximum demand was 3.98 or four kilowatt because compressor comes up and, and then it stays up for a few minutes. If you look at the graph in the middle of the page, three different colored lines, green for temperature reading, blue for power consumption by the air conditioner and red for the temperature set point on the thermostat. Again, set point about uh, 22 degrees uh, Celsius, 74 Fahrenheit. As the temperature goes, rises because AC is stopped, right? The blue line is uh, very close to 0.4 in uh, the, the middle. Then the AC is off, uh, slowly temperature rises. That's what expected. As the temperature crosses the threshold of 22.5 uh, Celsius, AC comes on. You see the spike, the blue spike comes up. That's the time AC stays on and AC is uh, drawing power. AC stays on for a few minutes. Then the room is cooled, cooled down. The green line goes down below the red line, AC is off. And that goes on like this, that's normal. What we did, we said, because we want to save energy during peak hours, We'll turn the AC off and see what happens for that classroom only. You don't turn it off, what you do, you raise the temperature setting. We went from 22.5 to 25 degrees C to, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit and ran this thing and it saw the change in that same one, uh, one to 5 p.m. time window for the AC, for the AC is not running, fan is running, lights are running. We use 1.4 kilowatt hour of energy and Peak demand was cut from four to 0.5. That's the biggest help, peak reduction. That's the number we see for that building. Let's move on. 
That was the heating, cooling application. This is application for lighting control. We went in office building, 500 square meter office building. This not what you see is not office building here. This building is the maintenance depot for school buses. Upstairs is the office. This is the office upstairs, same building. So we look at the office space, three areas in the office space. The middle part is the work area or filing area with the skylight. On the upper right-hand side is the staff working area. Below that is our conference room. Lights always on, regardless of the window light or skylight. That's the practice. We said we will put some dimmer circuits in these lights and see what happens. By putting dimmer circuit, we did two things. One is we schedule the light to be dimmed in lunch hour and after hours, after 6 p.m., not off, dim, because cleaning people have to come and clean the place. But once they're done, lights turned off. By dimming and, and limiting the time they're used, we see the savings in energy consumption for that floor only. Look at those numbers. With data from October 2016 to July, June 2017, we save about 30, 34% on a monthly basis. That's the benefit of lighting control. This is more detailed data here. The table that you see on my screen, if you look at the middle column, which says total calculated energy consumption without dimming, without control. October 399.9, about 400 kilowatt hour, November 423, December 426, and so on. That's the energy use without control. Left-hand side column is the energy use with control. You see 33, 34%. At the bottom of my page, I'm showing what the dimming level is. 40%, 45%, 60%. Those numbers came from our survey of the people on the floor, how they use the space and got those numbers. Those numbers can be changed. Suppose your office room shows 45% uh, lighting intensity. You have some people coming in for meetings, even more light. Just go to the your app and raise the temp, uh, number to 60%, as simple as that. Okay, now next example is rooftop solar. As I said before, we have built an open architecture platform which can take other applications besides heating and cooling and lighting that you have shown so far. This is my building in Virginia Tech. This building has rooftop solar. It has a smart inverter. That a smart inverter talks to my wise building platform like this. This is my screen capture from my laptop screen to show the information coming down from the rooftop solar. You can see the radiation, DC power, AC power, panel efficiency, inverter efficiency, uh, DC voltage, AC voltage, DC current, AC current, total energy produced, uh, rooftop in uh, solar radiation intensity, 865 watts per square meter, uh, ambient temperature, cell temperature, all of the data is here. Again, same wise building platform gives you this information. Last example is my battery storage. The building I showed you some time back, we put this small battery, 5 kilowatt, 12 kilowatt hour, and that battery is hung on the wall of the garage in the basement. The reason I show this, even though we put a battery bank on that garage level, we are not using up any parking space, very importantly, a parking space. We hang it on the wall. That means nobody is losing the parking spot. So we have done this again. This shows the screen capture from the battery part of the wise building platform. So that's, you can see the status is active, state of charge 98.9%, all data like lighting intensity, thermostat setting, rooftop solar output, battery storage, all of that is coming from the same wise building platform we showed before. So that's it, I'm done, and this is me. I gave you here, my, here on my screen my email address, my website, my website has more information. I'm also on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and, and, uh, and uh, many other social media, including YouTube. So with that, I'm going to stop here. So Pangoro can take back the screen and I will be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Saifur, for the very interesting presentation. And 
uh, for the audience, uh, please type in your question in the question box, uh, or either question box or the chat box. Uh, it's okay for me. Just type in your question, and Professor Saiful will uh, try to answer the question. Uh, at the moment, uh, there are some questions from the audience. First is a simple question. Uh, the audience would like to know whether the, they are allowed to to have the presentation. Can we send the copy of the presentation to the audience? I will uh, email you. I will email you on my slides after my talk, and you can you can circulate. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, there are some questions. Uh, from uh, Insinyur Bin Xiaoang, uh, he, he asked, has the built-in temperature sensor or controller in existing air conditioning unit has been unable to provide similar, similar temperature control and saving? Uh, uh, any comment? Similar, similar, Temperature meaning uh, we have a thermostat. The thermostat shows the indoor temperature, and it is programmed to turn on when the indoor temperature exceeds the set up temperature. Suppose I set twenty two degree Celsius setting. <laughs> AC is not running now. So the temperature slowly goes up beyond 22, more than 22, AC comes on. So this temperature reading and the control happens from the same same uh, thermostat. Is that the question? Uh, I think uh, he asked a uh, way we need uh, additional controller uh, to control the air temperature in the building. Why can't we just use the built-in control. I mean, if we purchase a AC system, usually it comes with a temperature control. I think this is what the, what is uh, no, no, the- no, you're, you're right, you're right. Okay, here's this thing, a good question. The thermostat comes with a controller, that is true. You don't need to buy a second one, you're not buying anything. What, you're, what I'm saying, that if you have an air conditioner that is coming with a thermostat, that's fine. But you have many, thermostats on the floor. And you cannot keep looking at one at a time going around the building. It takes too, too much time. So what we have done, we built a central system which get data from all your 100 thermostats in the building and show you what's happening. And you can, depending on the usage for different parts of the building, maybe somebody went to lunch in one part of the floor, they're not there. Why keep that thing cold all the time? Based on that information, you can selectively control with my platform so that we are becoming more energy efficient. That's the idea. Ah, oh, okay. Thank you, Professor Saipur. I think uh, very enlightening. And then we have also another question. Uh, uh, from Mr. Diastara Rahman, Rahmanda. How are we ensuring the thermostat that we use is still accurate and not cause? And if not, uh, uh, sorry, how do we ensure that the thermostat that we use is still accurate or not? Because if the thermostat is not accurate, so the vice building cannot monitor well. That is true. Thermostat doesn't go bad easily. It doesn't go bad. They're pretty good. And you can tell it is not functioning because. Uh, it is set to 22, it's not cooling. So you, that's when you change the thermostats. That is a normal maintenance operation that was building or not, you got to do it anyway. Otherwise the room is too hot all the time. So if some, if the, your thermostat goes bad, it rarely happens, but does, it's like 15 years old, you replace it. This is normal practice. Uh, there are uh, another, and the next question from Henry Nasution: uh, How to control the plug load? Plug load, okay. Plug load, you can buy. You can buy them in. I'm buy bought them in in Bangkok. In fact, you can buy the plug wireless 
smart plug load controllers costs, I don't know, four or five dollars, not more than that. And you can put the plug, uh, that controller I showed you the picture of on the on your wall, and then you connect your load to that smart plug, not to the wall plug. Uh, the next question from Dr. Chua. Uh, how effective is the energy storage in re reducing the maximum demand? How many percent can it cut down? Good question. That depends on the size of the battery. In my building, you see it's a 61 kilowatt peak load. I put a five kilowatt battery. So about what, 8% or so of the size. So I can cut 8% of the load. So when the peak happens, so depending on how big a battery you need to put in, you can decide how much peak load you can cut. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question from uh, Aki Francis Jr. Uh, what is the recommended recommendation solution for optimization of CO2 and O2 investment building? Data shows here that uh, if it CO2 level goes over 700 parts per million in a closed space. Above that, it is considered unhealthy. So you have to you have to uh, do something. First of all, measure that CO2 concentration. You can buy sensors in Jakarta or in Manila or in KL or in, or in Bangkok, any other or in Oman or in Qatar or whatever or Australia. Buy that sensor, or you can order from Amazon. In fact. <laughs> And put it in there, and it comes with an app, it is own app uh, on, on your smartphone. You can, you can sense it. The issue is this you can just see what it is, but you cannot do anything about anything with it. That's the problem. Our wise building platform will see the data about CO2 concentration, number one. Then it will it'll connect to the uh, floor air conditioner and turn the fan on to get more forced air. This is the contribution by deploying some building automation like wise building uh, this is there's a question but um i think this is not for you it's better to be answered by instant your letter uh, is there any written regulation for energy efficiencies for building in asian region so maybe uh, mr insignior insignior your will answer this question later <laughs> because uh, it's it's more suitable for him rather than uh, quest, uh, to Professor Saifur. Uh, we have still a lot of questions for Professor Saifur. Uh, please wait. The, uh, just uh, from doc, uh, Insignior Dr. Xiao Chun Lim, uh, does idling equipment which is not switched off completely or in standby mode, stand mode consume significant amount of energy? Uh, what is the percentage like for, what is the percentage uh, like for a typical building well these devices i, I don't even understand i got the question right these devices are connect, yeah are connected to the building light building building uh, network of course but they uh, they consume milliwatts milliwatts so it's never a concern for us that all these sensors are taking too much electricity that's not like your thermostat. Thermostat is the biggest energy consumer in this case. Like plug load doesn't take any load, any, any load itself. It's just sitting there. Thermostat takes some energy, but it is already there, right? You didn't put it in new. It is already there. So no change in the power consumption by us putting the sensors in your building. It's negligible. Uh, I think the question is asking so maybe the way I pr pronounce it because I'm not a native speaker of English. Uh, he, uh, the attendee asked a, because you said in your uh, presentation that some 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 equipment is not switched off, but it is put into standby. Uh, so is is this uh, rather than switching off but only in standby? Is is uh, the consumption is still significant or not? For example, well, uh, we, we uh, sorry, I think the question right. We do not put on standby. We do not. We turn oh, them off. Okay. Turn them off. 
Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the timer, uh, the next question from uh, Dr. S Engineer Senop Dermawan Panjaitan from Pontiana. Uh, for the timer, is it possible to be applied to fluorescent lamp? And how about the big data analysis? Since the since system must produce big data, what is the best cycle time to capture the data from the use sensor to the data taken uh, to the from the use sensor, so the data taken are more efficient regarding the data storage. So Dr. Seno is talking about. Right. Well, but two questions about whether we can use dimmer for fluorescent lamp, and second is about big data. Uh, what is the uh, the optimum uh, data capturing? Well, I have used the dimmer for fluorescent tube lights. But if you dim too much, it begins to flicker. There's a limit how much you can dim. Fluorescent dim lights. LED lights have no limit. I can dim to 10%, no problem. So answer is fluorescent tube lights, you can dim some, maybe up to 80% from 100%, but not much less than that because it begins to flicker. LED can be dimmed to 5%, 10%, no problem, number one. Data collection frequency, we collect every few seconds, but because the data gets too big, we don't, we don't store it. We store data every minute, every minute. And then, then see what was done last 24 hours. So we don't store, mm -hmm. we can collect, we can, we can measure, but not store more, um, one minute or more, no more than, no less than one minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question from Ms. Tertang Nguyen Kuang, uh, from the lecture, I realized that the brain of PEM is not smart device, but the central processing unit, which gives the proper action based on actual condition. Do you have any, do you have any specific approach for determining issues of different building, of different buildings? Do you use a customer questionnaire or you use uh, some kind of survey or what? Yeah, we did. So we go to the building, talk to the people that are working in the building, understand how they work, when they go to lunch, when they go to prayer, when they leave, when they come. Based on that information, we design the dimming, dimming levels and the thermostat temperature set point level. So yes, survey. Uh, another question. From Dr. Chua, uh, how and when the energy storage start to cut down the peak? Is it by setting the time to stop or any other method? It is by time because we know when the power company charges more money for peak load. The time is pre-announced. We know the time. So we will charge the battery the night before to make sure battery is fully fully charged. And then we will turn the battery on to discharge when the peak period starts, in our case, 1 p.m., and then leave it on. And if you make sure we cannot exceed the 20% uh, state of charge, otherwise battery is damaged. So we, we have to make sure that we can keep it going for that many that many hours. This pre-program, yes. Uh, the next question. The next question uh, has there ha has there been any application of AI in the building energy management? Yes. Uh, we showed you for the lighting control that building sixty percent for the chief's office, forty five percent for the uh, conference room. 65% for the work area. How do you go those numbers? We use machine learning using the customer usage of the space to come up with those numbers. See, as AI was used, machine learning was used to come up this percentage, percentage dimming level numbers. Uh, the next question. Uh, hi, Professor. When you did when you did dimming and lighting, did you consider depending dependency analysis to cooling load? Uh, we did not because we LED lighting, 
So LED lighting does not contribute much to cooling load. Fluorescent does some, incandescent light contributes quite a bit to cooling load. So in our case, we helped some, we did not measure it. We did dim to 60%, LED light does not give up too much heat anyway. So cooling load is not impacted, typically not. Uh, the next question from my, my, uh, Mr. Michael Montefalcon. Uh, how accurate are temperatures that temperatures data get gathered from smart building sensors? How do we test and maintain the sensors? Well, you don't maintain anything in this case. They are there. And the we have to assume that the temperature sensor thermostat you bought, it assume they're accurate. Otherwise, why buy it? We assume that they have, they have been tested. So, but we don't, we don't, nothing to maintain there. This is how it is done. It's, it's always working. If it goes bad, you replace it. Uh, the next question, how do you integrate different brain communication output to your system? Uh, do we need to individually, do we need to individually need to, to send register, register map to for those devices? to you to program to this platform or we can integrate, integrate it by ourselves from Hassamedin Majlisi. Right, right. Well, at the beginning, you have to onboard the device and the device comes to its own app and using their app for the device, like a smart plug has an app, smart switch has an app, uh, dimmer has an app. So using that app, you program it. You can do one at a time, but if you, then you have to have five different apps, one for the thermostat, one for plug load, one for smart plug, one for uh, ventilation, five different apps. If you use wise building, wise building can look at all those apps and give you only one app on your screen to look at everything. That's the difference between doing five apps, keeping track of five apps as opposed to one app. You can do all five apps one at a time if you want to do that, but that's fine. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Mr. Arvin Sumari. Uh, just a simple question. In your opinion, can we use artificial intelligence approach to increase the energy efficiency? Or maybe you have ever tried to use it or may have planned to use such technology? Well, you can use AI to make the building operation more sensitive to the needs of the building. Why I say that? Typically, in a, an office building, you have thermostat setting. Nobody changes those things. They're still all the time the same numbers. If you use AI approach to manage those thermostats, it will be responsive to the situation at the current time. People going to lunch, you raise the temperature by two degrees. Nobody cares. That's AI application. No, we don't do that normally. You must have a platform like Wise Building to deploy that AI developed routine to change the set points. So that's how I plan to use the AI in this case. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, from Muhammad Khair Hassan. Uh, thank you, Professor Saifur. Uh, very informative sharing. Could you elaborate on battery management system? How do you monitor? SOC, SOH, uh, do you mind to serve the battery performance profile for a day? Yeah, the depth of charge, state of charge are given, when you buy the battery system, it comes with its own battery management system. It comes with it, BMS, it comes with it. What we did, we know the API for the battery management system, and then we connect the BMS platform to the WISE building platform. So you can see the battery status directly from the battery management system screen. You can see we put everything in one platform called WISE building. So from one platform, you can see the BMS system, not just uh, lighting and air conditioning only. So the answer is yes. You have to have the BMS that comes with the battery package. Uh, the, the next question, uh, the, the, uh, from 
Hani uh, I'm, I'm not sure this uh, Mr. Hani Bergman or uh, Miss Hani Bergman. Uh, the challenge for IoT impl IoT implementation is interoperability of different devices involved and also communication protocol. Do you think that in a country like Indonesia, the concept can be applied without uh, without develop the proper interface like you have? So we have to develop the same interface. Uh, should we develop the same interface? This is question from Dr. Hani Bergman. Yes, like we did, we did develop the interface ourselves, and that interface works for many protocols. If you want to do it yourself, you can you can uh, do the research yourself like we did. We have publications, we can send you some links, or you can use the wise building platform, talk to BM Controls Company, and they can help you uh, to use their, uh, their platform for license to that so that you don't have to build yourself. You can use that wise building platform as a license to, uh, to run the software package. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, in addition to all this question, I, I would like also to ask some question to take this opportunity to uh, get some insight from you. So just uh, the cost of building this smart system, this, uh, this thing, uh, uh, is it cheaper or more expensive than the than the shaping obtained itself? Because sometimes people think that build this kind of uh, fancy system will cost a lot that even the shaping cannot justify of installing this kind of system? Well, this question comes up all the time. I have deployed this solution in some buildings. I've seen their energy savings. They have, uh, they have uh, experienced. And for the building in the US and Virginia, the money they invest and the money they save by controlling, they get the money back in two years or less. Suppose you spend $1,000 to buy this system and you save $500 per year electric bill. In two years, you've saved $1,000. You return the $1,000 loan from the bank. And then the remaining five, six years, your bank loan is paid so that you can enjoy it. The savings will be yours. So the answer is, it takes two years in, the, in Virginia. Indonesia and Malaysia take less because your AC is running more than most of the time. There's more savings, the AC is running more. So it'll be less than two years return for your investment. Uh, thank you. Uh, another thing is, uh, because before I worked in the manufacturing sector, manufacturing sector uh, now I work in uh, polyester uh, fiber yarn manufacturing, but before I work in a uh, building management company, so we manage a uh, high rise building in Jakarta. And when I uh, watch your presentation, it's, it, it's kind of interesting because in the past we never uh, monitor uh, quality up to the like uh, CO2 concentration or to concentrate because we only we only monitor monitor the temperature i think only temperature and at most uh, some building will monitor the humidity but i see that many building only monitor the temperature not even the humidity but your system will also monitors uh, co2 and thing i think it's very good a very good thing because uh, it's very important not only just the temperature but or how many oxygen you have inside the building is a very crucial factor to the health of the occupant, I think. Then this is this should be uh, disseminated to many many building uh, many building management who, who may operate the building because I think until now many people don't don't monitor that kind of thing, uh, don't realize that this is also important. That's I think that's just some comment from me, and. Uh, at the moment, I don't have any other question from from participant. I think let me check. Uh, just another comment about the question from uh, one of participant about uh, regulation for energy efficiency in ASEAN region. Uh, I think a uh, different country will have different uh, regulation, but I, for example, in Indonesia. Uh, we have regulation for energy efficiency. Uh, so 
there are certain limit uh, in Indonesia for uh, for building or industry with just energy more than 6,000 ton of oil equivalent, we have to carry out uh, energy management program. So we have to answer that energy efficiency measures are taken are taken place, and we have a continue continuity of program year by year. Uh, government will check whether we have a, a program uh, to maintain to, to to sustain this energy efficiency because sometimes people do banjir then after the next year the energy efficiency thing is forgotten this this uh, my small comment about uh, energy efficiency regulation in ASEAN at least in Indonesia we have I think in other country like Malaysia Thailand uh, Singapore Philippines uh, Laos Cambodia Vietnam uh, Myanmar I think they all have this kind of similar regulation uh, but at least from the Indonesian perspective, uh, this is uh, we, we have the written regulation about that, and uh, there is a penalty for company who fail to follow this energy efficiency measures. Uh, Doctor Yo, uh, Insel Yo, uh, anything uh, that you want to add? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Pangoro. Uh, regarding the uh, energy efficiency regulation, uh, just to add on. Uh, yes, uh, it is true that each country in ASEAN has their different uh, laws as well as act as well as regulation and energy efficiency. Um, what we do in the AFU as ASEAN as Federation of Engineering Organization and AER, ASEAN Engineering Register, is uh, we are trying to uh, do a database as well as compilation of um, the regulations of all the energy efficiency uh, requirements. And I believe uh, it's supposed to be published soon. And of course, uh, do follow us for other webinars where we're going to actually explain as well as share the uh, these particular uh, regulations of each country uh, to our ASEAN members. Just like how we share the electrical installation regulations to you all uh, in the past webinars. So that one we will be arranging soon uh, so that um, you are aware as well. For example, if you are in Indonesia, uh, you want to know about energy efficiency requirements in Cambodia, in Singapore, in Malaysia. Uh, we will actually be coming out with a guideline as well as uh, a compilation handbook uh, for our ASEAN engineers. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, I'm, it's an, yeah. Thank you, uh, I Professor. Yeah. Uh, I believe I uh, uh, that is about it uh, for today. Uh, it's a very uh, fruitful and uh, first time we hear so many questions uh, to uh, the speaker itself. and. Uh, Prof Saifu has also answered it very well, and I believe everyone will be very happy to uh, uh, take home uh, today's presentation uh, uh, knowledge as well as also the Q&A session uh, replies as well. So I believe uh, uh, before we end the session today, uh, once again, uh, thank you Prof Saifu uh, for being with us and, and Pak Angoro. And a little uh, certificate of appreciation I would like to present uh, unfortunately, we are unable to give uh, a face-to-face -face presentation of the certificate. Uh, we, we're going to here give you an e-certificate to Prof. Saipo, uh, being the speaker for our lecture series, Energy Efficiency in Smart Buildings Through IoT Sensor Integration. Thank you once again, Prof. Saipo, for uh, your uh, uh, sharing today. And uh, don't forget, uh, in fact, uh, Prof. Saipo has also agreed to share more in the coming uh, weeks, so be on the lookout. And besides Prof. Saifu, again, I would like to thank uh, Pak Angoro Yudo, Nuswana Tauro, who actually uh, volunteered to be the moderator today. Uh, he's also one of our alternate representatives from Indonesia uh, in this particular committee. And uh, once again, for uh, helping out uh, in moderating this particular session. And uh, for participants-wise, of course, we won't be fleshing out your e-certificate uh, one by one. Uh, what we will do is, after the event, uh, we're going to email you the certificate of appreciation. And uh, for those who do not receive, do add, let us know because uh, we might miss out your names and uh, unable to contact you. Uh, you can email to us uh, if you are unable to receive the certificate. And as for um, and as for the presentation slides, uh, we will actually uh, uh, get it from Prof. Saifu and email to you after the event. Okay. And uh, before we end, again, uh, once again, thanks uh, all, uh, including uh, the speaker, PII, as well as IEEE uh, Indonesia, uh, for making it happen for Distinguished Series number three. And uh, definitely, uh, Series number four is on the way. And uh, just to share, uh, we're going to have um, uh, one or two more webinars coming up 
uh, by end of the year, uh, end of the month, sorry, uh, and uh, we'll be actually sharing with you uh, the details of it and uh, hope that you enjoy uh, our sharing of today. And uh, again, uh, let's uh, work together and uh, share and, of course, uh, benefit the uh, ASEAN engineers. Uh, and that's all I have. Uh, Prof. Saifu and uh, Pak Anggoro, do you have any final words uh, before we end the uh, webinar today? No, I'm very uh, happy. Professor. Very good set of questions. Oh. That means they listen carefully what I was saying. <laughs> okay. In that questions mm -hmm. appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. From me, okay. I, I, would, I, just want to say, I just want to say stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, let's pray yeah. that this pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic will soon will soon be over and we can resume to our normal activities like we thought in the beginning we can have a, some broad show in ASEAN countries and maybe Professor Saifur can visit us again in Indonesia like in the past we have the honor the privilege of having uh, Professor Saifur visit but not because of pandemic no one can visit anyone uh, we are stuck <laughs> in our own I hope everything will soon be over and we can resume our uh, normal activities. Okay. I mean, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. With Thank that, uh, we, we sign up uh, for today. And uh, before we end, uh, also to wish uh, those uh, uh, who are who is celebrating Chinese New Year, Happy Chinese New Year. You still have another uh, one week of celebration. And uh, we look forward to see you all again in our next webinar. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.